who are the readers and who pays the bills. So I'm going to be discussing the, the early history in terms of those three factors of uh, production. Uh, starting off with writers, uh, I'll, I'll start off with the Eastern Cape and then I'll touch on KZN and I'll also touch on, on Kimberley, which was, of course, the, the, the home of uh, Solomon Plyke. Now, uh, as far as the, uh, what um, Alette pointed out, that things started in the Eastern Cape, uh, this is due really to the advent of missionaries. Uh, I think almost first uh, outside the Western Cape, uh, that they arrived from, uh, in fact, Scotland in the early 1820s. And they established a mission school uh, called Lovedale. And that had got nothing to do with love, uh, with which you and I are familiar. It's got to do with the fact that the sponsor was a Dr. John Love from Glasgow. Uh, and in fact, it's about 100 uh, kilometers from where we're sitting. You have got the two big mission schools uh, of, of, of Heel Town uh, near Fort Beaufort, uh, or Buffalo, by the way, which is Beaufort, by the way, <laughs> name change perhaps called for, and uh, Lovedale at Decaney, formerly known as uh, Allen. Now, um, I'm only going to mention a uh, uh, and, and sorry, Lovedale was the Presbyterian church, what we would today call in Kota the, the Chave church. And uh, Yale Town, near Bofolo, is the Wesile or the Methodist uh, mission. The Anglicans did try to establish a mission station, but they were chased out by the local whites in about 1900. Uh, and that's why you have St. Andrews. St. Andrews today is built on the ruins of the old Anglican uh, mission, uh, mission school. Uh, but the one missionary that I will praise by name is the Reverend John Benny, B-E-N-N-I-E, -N -N -E, because he was the first person to reduce the Isikosa language to a written form and to, to print it out. So you can say that uh, Black journalistic writing got its front foot in Lovedale because of um, Reverend Benny, but uh, having had that front foot, it, it, it soon went into reverse because as time progressed, the black journalists and the emergent intellectuals realized that they had been trapped by a confidence trick. By this time, the Reverend Benny was, was late, let me say. Uh, and that promises had been made that the problem the, the, the missionary line, basically, the line of the entire Cape government, including the Northern Cape, which was very different to what happened in KZN, is your problem is not that you are Black. Your problem is that you don't accept our version of civilization. So accept our civilization. Throw out yours and you will be free and equal like us Europeans. Only to find out much later, the problem is that you are black and however much you accept our civilization, our white people will never accept you as, as equal. Now, around about the time, 
that that was happening on the education front the wars of dispossession are are coming we're, we're coming to an end and the chiefs the traditional leaders who up to that point had been the leaders of the resistance found themselves co-opted by the colonial system whereas in the reverse the educated intelligentsia who had been co-opted by the colonial system in the first place became the leaders of the new resistance and, and i think somewhere on the program uh, I, I saw quoted um, the, the famous poem Zemkin Komo, where he says, Ishia Fakadolo, Kutuman Gosiba. You know what is Fakadolo? It, it's an old rifle. You put it across your knee, you break it across your knee, and you put in the bullets. Where, that's why it's called Fakadolo. You know? Of course, by the time the uh, the, the chiefs got fakadol or the whites got machine guns. So it wasn't really a, an equal contest. So in terms of writers, the first factor of production um, here in the Eastern Cape, there were. In the Northern Cape, there were. I mentioned Saul Pikey. And in KZN, you have figures like John uh, John L uh, what John L Dube, uh, who founded Ilanga Lase Natal. So writers you have in South Africa throughout the country. The difference is readers. Now, a, 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 a national figure who is not yet, as far as I know, taught in schools, to be very, very critical to the history of the Eastern Cape in South Africa, is the prophet Nsikana Kagaba, who died in 1821. And he is the prophet who brought, brought Christianity to the Kosa area of, of South Africa. So that when the missionaries arrived, it is not as if they were bringing something new. It was not as if they were bringing something foreign. Uh, it was recognized by Kosa people that these white people are simply telling us they are expanding what we were already told by Nsikan. So that whereas in other parts of South Africa, there was a natural resistance to the Christian religion and to missionary. Um, in addition to Nsikana, there are large numbers, or there were many, many refugees. Uh, were we all against xenophobia, right? Uh, there were many, many refugees from the uh, Sharkin Wars. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I honestly think if there are any colleagues here from KZN, uh, you you really ought to reconsider uh, the image of uh, a, a mass murderer. But let's uh, leave that. That's just my Eastern Cape prejudice. Um, the, the, no, no, no. Those are the people of Amashlubi, Amabele, Amazizi, and others who were then demonized or misrepresented by the name Amamfengu. And they had been so uh, reduced by their, their suffering during the Fekane Wars uh, that they were ready to welcome anybody that was prepared to help them. And so there, there, there is a certain tree uh, if you take the gravel road that goes from Nushwa Pedi to Alice Diken, in the middle of a plain, you will see a great big tree standing all alone, the Mashu tree, where the so-called Amamfengu swore 
to accept Christianity, to educate their children, and to obey the government. So most of the early converts came from among those refugees. And then in 1857 came the disaster among the Kozak people of the prophecies of Nongnauze, which I won't go into. Uh, but one can <clears throat> ask, did all the Kozak believe the prophecies of Nongnauze? No, they didn't. 80% did, but 20% refused to kill their cattle. Uh, they were called by the others Gorgotia, stingy people, because they, they refused to kill their cattle. But because of that catastrophe, they also emerged as partisans of this new education. And this love of education, or, or, or the Western version of it, uh, translated into economic progress. You had large numbers of small farmers, small producers, which the uh, noted historian Colin Bundy has called peasants. A peasant is not just simply Kaba, a, a rural person. A peasant is somebody who works for himself or herself, does not uh, farm only to survive, but farms for sale. In other words, a peasant is a somebody who has joined up, not to Westernism, but to capitalism, and believes in the promise of capitalism. And I'd just like you to uh, read something from the, the magistrate, the white magistrate of Kumani, then, then Queen Star, where he compares white farmers with black farmers and uh, what he says is this, and this is a white magistrate speaking. He says, it is indisputably the case that comparing Africans with Europeans, taking man for man and acre for acre, the African producers with a smaller extent of ground and with more primitive equipment, more than the Europeans. So the African farmer was in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, excelling the, the, the white farmers. Uh, and again, this was largely due to the fact that they had embraced Western technology. So you had a, a vast pool of ordinary ground up people that had embraced the European project on, on both ideological and economic grounds. But even on political grounds, uh, in 1853, the Cape Colony got the vote. It was not one person, one vote. The women, of course, not people, not getting votes. Any of them, not even white women. And with only men, and I mean men, of property that could vote. Not unemployed, not workers, only men of property could vote. But because there were so many black people, not only intellectuals, but farmers who qualified for the vote, that they held the balance of power in the Cape Parliament. So although they were not sufficient in numbers, there were six parliamentary seats in the Eastern Cape where Black people held the balance of power, 40% of the vote, and with the Boers and the English hostile to each other, they made a difference. And that is why they manipulated their political power to ensure that only white people uh, who supported their interests would govern 
the colony. Uh, again, we could talk, uh, uh, some people might say that it's too little, too late. I just simply say they were heavily involved in the politics of the day even though that politics was basically a white on white competition but nevertheless they held the balance of power uh, and you can compare that to the situation in kzn where although the, the the franchise the right to vote was theoretically non-racial and believed in london to be non-racial but only three Natal Africans. Now that I've left out a couple of norms. Three, one, two, three Africans ever got the vote in Natal. And in this way, the, the readership in an area like KZN, the people who could read newspapers was basically confined to those who were on the mission stations. And of course, you could read. But you couldn't, that reading did not translate into political, a political way. Whereas I've got some statistics uh, here. In uh, Heel Town, that is the, 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 the Wesina mission station near Fort Bovin, in 1865, there were 700 or 800. I, I, I don't mean only the mission station, but for fall or in general, 700 to 800 readers uh, just in and around Bofolo. They mainly read the Bible, but that's because they couldn't get books because there were few books and they couldn't afford them. In, in Witterbergen, that is what is today Herschel, uh, up by the Lesotho border, there were 400 people who could read, uh, and the, the, the missionary up there says, generally they have a taste for reading and purchase books as far as they can afford to do so. And there were 15 journals or magazines that were circulating up there, and that was in 1865. Uh, again, the, 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 the readership was extremely limited. Uh, in KZN and in the Northern Cape, but there was a viable readership in the Eastern Cape as early as 1865, and, and that is what translates into uh, a financially viable newspaper. So now I um, come to the third factor of production. And I'm covered, out of time, Jeff. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you have to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> we give you more time since we nearly killed him. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> let, me go, let me go very, very quickly. Uh, the issue is finance. Uh, the, early, the early newspapers were uh, financed by the missions, therefore, they had to toe the missionary line, even where they disagreed. Uh, and that is why the fundamental breakthrough in the black press is John Tengo Jabalu, who uh, started his own newspaper, Imbors of Ansundu, uh, and is well known. But um, you have to ask who put up the money. Uh, the money for to finance Imbors of Ansundu was put up by two white businessmen in Kronle, uh, that is King Williamstown. Uh, which was Jabalu's hometown, uh, Mr. Weir and Mr. Rose Innes, who were also regarded as quote unquote friends of the natives. They were liberal, they were in parliament, but they did not do that out of the goodness of their hearts. They were sufficiently enlightened to appreciate that these people now have money and we need to start advertising. So it's not only black journalism, but it's actually uh, advertising media aimed at black people. It also starts with Imvo Zabansundu. Now, uh, those of you who have read or looked at Tbilisi uh, Tletiana's little book on emergent intellectuals, 
uh, because many people uh, didn't like Jababu, and, and not without reason, uh, we'll, we'll see that the article on Jababu criticizes uh, Jababu for accepting white money. But what happened uh, to the people who didn't like Jababu? Those are the people who found it something you'd excuse after so many years. I still can't pronounce uh, in Utera, uh, correctly. That is the organization of Dr. Kubusana uh, and A.K. Soga that uh, later became the African National Congress. Jabalu's group later became the, the unity movement. Now they want to put up a newspaper to compete with Jababu, who did they go to? Got to get money from somewhere. They went to Cecil Rhodes. <laughs> Cecil Rhodes funded Kubusana's newspaper. And when Rhodes fell from power, and Rhodes's protege, Dr. Jamison, fell from power, their newspaper, Izwi Labantu, died. Um, now, I'm just quickly going to steal some time to take this to the national level. Uh, now, the, the uh, okay, so we've got what writers, readers, and financiers. But when gold is discovered in 1886, basically the whole country becomes irrelevant. Uh, and the newspapers like Imvo and Ilanga La Sidutao. Uh, became basically like, uh, I think it's called Grocott's Mail, <laughs> uh, a little local advertising sheet. Yeah? Uh, and it's necessary to have newspapers that take a national line and are also multilingual because Zulu and uh, Skosa are mutually intelligible. Uh, and Sutu and Swana are mutually intelligible, but if you want to have a national readership, you've got to publish in both. And it was uh, a group of journalists based in Kanteng. I won't go into the details. Uh, there's a book about their newspaper called uh, The People's Paper, about a newspaper called Abantu Bato, Abantu being uh, Zuru Kosa and Bato being Sutu Swana. And this paper appeared in three languages. English, which was uh, the national language, the language of politics, uh, and, 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 and the two major African groups of languages. Uh, and they, oh, oh, the other thing, the important thing about this newspaper, it was founded in 1912. And I hope that even those of you who have turned against the ANC will know that 1912 with the year in which the ANC was founded. Not only was it also founded in 1912, it was founded primarily by the same person who founded the ANC, that is Pixley Salmon. And he was the one who said, we need to have a newspaper. He got all the, 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 the black journalists that were active in Parteng together. They launched this newspaper in the three languages and they heavily criticized uh, the, 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 the white fascism in racism in this country. But of course, um, politics is politics. And a, a, a click, I can say, of other journalists, among whom I'm sorry to relate, I know she's a woman's icon and so on, uh, not so much Charlotte McClake, but her husband, Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't like the direction. They didn't like the Congress. So what did they do? They approached the mine owners. They approached the Chamber of Mine. Uh, and I want to read to you something. And uh, this, uh, this information comes from uh, Mueli Scotta. For those of you who are really familiar, Scotta was the person who published a sort of who's who of black intellectuals in 1927, which is our, the fundamental document uh, on, on early black leadership in the whole country. Uh, he says here, Dube Msana, Bele, Makreke, 
they went to man in charge of Chamber of Mines and told him these young people, namely the supporters of Ubuntu Bato, are very extreme. And they wanted to start a newspaper in opposition. And he said, the man from the Chamber of Mines, all right, come again. So when they next met, went, Chamber had decided to start a paper for them. Wouldn't give them money, but started paper for them and employed them and also took all the compositors. You, you know that in the old days, you used to have to set up the type uh, on the, the newspapers. So they, they, they took all the money and they started their own newspaper, which was called Umtiteli Wabantu, uh, which was a newspaper backed by the Chamber of Mines. Uh, it was distributed free in, in all the mines. Uh, Abantu Bato, therefore, uh, could not compete and went out of business in 1931. So, um, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think I try by talking for less than 45 minutes. Excellent. Yes. Uh, professors, you know, talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank we, you. We and don't uh, have to stop. Apologies you. again for that okay. uh, unfortunate no accident. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, over now uh, to Sanele and uh, Chingana, who is based at UCT uh, and who has also uh, recently we completed his PhD in this area. Still doing it, Alex. Okay. <laughs> Still doing it. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. Alex. And uh, um, I'm really grateful for the invitation, um, you know, to come and speak here in this colloquium on these very important matters. And, you know, in thinking about decolonial approaches to uh, the practice, study, and teaching of journalism. Uh, so for me, it really feels like a, a full cycle um, coming back into uh, the school, um, bringing back to Rhodes, um, but not as a, a you know a timid 19-year-old mm -hmm. undergraduate student who was having sleepless nights um, in his labs and corridors about 10 years ago um, for about three years, uh, but now as someone who's got a little um, you know something to offer um, in the conversation about thinking about the colonial and journalism curriculum practice. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, this colloquium is looking at really big themes, um, you know, including issues of canonicity and how that inf um, informs curriculum, journalistic practices in which the keynote speaker yesterday um, outlined very carefully, uh, Professor Tawana Cooper. Um, and some of these issues um, that the colloquium is um, um, looking into is the um, uh, you know, the issues of the multilingualism, our rich history of black journalism in the Eastern Cape and across the country. And, uh, Professor uh, Jeff Perez has just uh, done a beautiful job in giving like a, a very broad um, sort of uh, mapping of issues of, you know, readership, writers, um, and also financing. Um, so for me really what i'm going to share with you this morning uh would be some thoughts um on methods of reading uh the storytelling practices and also political discourses um that you know emerge not only in the you know newspapers um and when the in the advent of, of, of missionaries in the Eastern Cape, but also maybe thinking about um, storytelling practices from as uh, in the late independent period, and that is in the centuries before colonialism, and to, to trace their shoots and co it, uh, of continuity in, in the early colonial era. Um, and by deep reading for me, I mean paying attention to the existence of the multiplicity of complex conceptual structures um in the accounts that you get in these newspapers you know abantu bantu mtetelini um mtetelini um um eskidimi um and other uh, you know many black presses of the time um alongside you know powerful symbolic discourse and modes of exposition contained in the accounts um, and this immediately challenges the persistent habits uh, by scholars to locate storytelling practices and political discourse squarely in the advent of colonial technologies of the press, neglecting the pre-colonial modes of storytelling and journalistic research. 
Um, and it also encourages us to go beyond um, reading these storytelling practices and storytellers ababalisi um, in biographical ways uh, without a sustained engagement in these political discourses they, they were um, recording in these newspapers and paying attention not only to the African languages, but in which these discourses were recorded, but in very in various platforms, but in the vernacular concepts that are deployed, uh, that they were using or that they were mobilizing to navigate change. So in my exploration today, I want to propose a historical method which contains four elements of reading these practices and political disposition of the late independent era and the late um, and early 19th century. One, it is paying attention to the political conditions surrounding the production of these records. Two, the centering of the intellectual inheritances of Ababalisi, which include centering the deep histories that they inherit from their family members um, through storytelling at home before they get into the missionary um, you know, presses and schools as the fund foundational ways of in which they learn about this. So the family becomes a very important um, center in which you have to think about you know, these knowledges and these as, as writers. And three, uh, paying attention to the semantic density of the concepts used by these writers, Hogan Ababalis. I want to use the concept Ababalis, um, which really goes beyond just writing, but also other forms in which stories were told inside and also outside of the um, you know, missionary stations and also the presses, because they continued to be these forms of, of, of storytelling that we have been against uh, in other um, um, spaces. And at fourth, um, <clears throat> for, 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 for us to consider reading these stories in their wider conversation corpus in which references resounded where similar concepts were mobilized. Um, and this is not meant to be a, a prescriptive or a, an exhaustive um, sort of like framework or consideration of these methods, but ways in which you can start to think together about how we can start reading those texts. So my contribution today will focus on uh, Samuel Edward Hunem uh, Kai. Um, and because of time, I will focus on one of his many articles he contributed um, in Umtete um, newspaper in 1927, in which he was focusing on issues of political authority. And many of us know him as one of the most prolific and towering, um, in every sense of the word, uh, Tosa writer journalist and historian of his time. Um, so among many ideas that Mkayi wrestled with um, were issues of political authority um, in, the, the, in the tapestry of the work um, that he composed over uh, many years um, practicing as a writer. So I start in um, 1927. And in 1927, it was well over 17 years since the consolidation of the Union government in South Africa. And already at this time, there had been mineral discoveries that had taken place um, in 1867, um, which required super cheap labor. Um, and this labor also um, based on squarely on the basis of race. At the same time, around that time, there were racial anthropologists that had developed theories of how black people um, were inferior, which elaborated on the social Darwinist and eugenic doctrines that viewed the body as the privileged trope, a dramatic shift from the early forms of colonialism, which were based on the forms of civilizing the, the native, um, where many Africans um, like uh, Yogobas and Jabavu in the um, late 18, um, in the late 19th century still hope still hoped that they could participate fully in the political um, affairs as citizens. Um, so in, in, in 1927, we, we have a political arrangement in South Africa where it's clear that everything is based on racial grounds. So in this context, the skills, the competences of the natives um, that they possessed stopped mattering in particular arts of citizenship the government valued because black people at this point were synonymous with cheap labor and being inferior. 
and the Land Act, amongst many other acts, followed, followed uh, prompting um, <clears throat> uh, many Black people, um, you know, uh, to, 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 to write many accounts um, criticizing this. Um, and one perhaps um, poignant way that captures the conditions of the Black people uh, after 1910 is written by Solomon Plaki, um, who was a journalist practicing in Kimberley at the time, who writes um, in, the, um, um, in, in, in his book um, uh, uh, um, that the awakening, uh, this is very important quote is that awakening on Friday morning, June 20, 1913, the South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a pariah in the land of his birth. So at this point, I am imagining that uh, he was thinking deeply about these disasters and therefore starts to think about ways in which he can rethink uh, political authority through contributing his articles in Intiti. Right? Uh, and and Kai also realizes that there is something deeply wrong in the political sphere as it is shaping up under white leadership and is trying to find intellectual resources to help his embroiling critic by drawing um, from past ideas and also retool these ideas to navigate this change. Um, so he's doing really is engaged in stuff of political philosophy in this article. So he's also thinking about how politics should mediate contending interests and um, mediating not only just contending interests, but mediating past and present, the living and the dead, um, or the living dead, the ancestors, mediation between people who think differently, and so on. And his um, articles are therefore political critics of the time, and uh, by you know drawing and using these intellectual resources of the past to think about alternative ways in which political authority can be constituted. So I'm considering his article. Um, it was called, in, it's titled in <clears throat> He published it on, on, on 4 June, 1927. And here in this article, uh, Mkai is advancing um, arguments about the importance of Obuzwe, uh, which is often translated by, uh, you know, English speakers as nationhood. And I kind of complicate this reading of what we, this, what uh, these concepts mean, what Ubuzwe means in this instance, because over time, the notions of what Ubuzwe and Isizwe means changes, right? So I stick to using the concept um, Ubuzwe or Isizwe. Um, uh, so he's doing that in the context of the, uh, the stubborn British colonialism uh, and, and, and uh, that has just been fully entrenched at this time. So at the core of his argument is that Necess the, the, there's the necessity that different Isiswe in Southern Africa come together to form one Isiswe, a strong front united against the forces of colonialism. These Isiswe include, but not limited to Amakosa, Besutu, Abba Zulu, and Abatuan. And already we can see at this point that Mkai's notions as of, of Isiswe have um, uh, starting to see Amakos Abetswana as almost like different, different, different people, because the the sense of what Isizwe means is based on, on 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 difference, right? So at this point already we're seeing that that idea that Amakosa Abezulu Abesuto are different has already shaped. Um and um. And this is different, for example, when you're listening to earlier writers who are writing about Isis, like Soga, um, you know, and, and, and earlier writers like Aupa in this meeting. All right. So one of the first arguments he's making is that the colonial attack aims at cutting rule of Isis by removing Ingos uh, from its city and destroys its kingship. And from Kai, um, this is done to cut Isizwe's relationship with what he calls Utiko, the creator. In other words, Mkai is arguing that the institution of kingship is deeply sacred and it connects Isizwe to Utiko directly. 
So without Utiko, the season um argues that see the sipele in kizi yo yobuntu. Sipele ukuz temba. Ibe kukufa kwa soke oko. So it loses the spirit of Ubuntu, its confidence, and that becomes its demise. And to be clear here, Nkai is seems to be suggesting that there's a metaphysical and a spiritual relationship between Isizwe and is anchored in the institution of kingship. And therefore, an attack in the institution is a direct attack to the Isizwe's spiritual connection to the creator. So there's like a big philosophical argument that he is, Kai is making here. Um, and it's about the, uh, you know, the mediation between the living um, and, and the dead and the, and the, and the ancestors. Um, and then I'll go to maybe the last argument uh, that he's making here from Kai. He is saying that without kinship, there is no real power, but just concepts and just warm bodies. So the real power in kinship, in, in the context in which he's writing, he argues that lies squarely in the, um, you know, uh, uh, in the hands of Europeans, because they have power to determine rule and how it is shaped. So um, they determined and instituted um, all the rules through which the small is Israel used to rule themselves. And then he argues that umtu angate ati abisutu kwamshweshwe ayaz bazo pasazi laula na seswazi na kubetuan kandi hai ezon kosi sezi laula nge miteto ye pizzo e shanga na kanyo gonyaka donga nye lwe ni kulu nili chikelele enga ako oko nazo semka ama ni miteto yazo yomuzo. So um, to briefly, uh, you know, translate what he's saying is that one would think that Abesutu of Mushweshwe ruled themselves and that uh, so too in Swaziland among the, uh, and also among the Tswanas, but that is not so because Mbosi rules by imitator of the Pizzo that meets once a year under the governor general, and therefore they are not far from their own imitator of Obozwe. So the colonial, uh, the colonial instituted laws Kai argues fragment or fragment the family, fragment the respect, the sanity, and the indigenous people's respect of the important institutions such as the seers in Bone. In other words, when control or administration are grounded on things that do not make Isisu's interest a priority, it breaks the two fundamental tenets of Umbuzo, Umbuzo, Isiswe, and Imitato. So it is curious that Mkai at this point makes a turn to call groups Isiswe located in the Southern Africa Isiswani. And this seems to suggest that Mkai was in fact thinking of the makeup of British Isiswe, a constellation of different European Isiswe. And so Mkai is therefore deploying the concept Isiswana as a relational concept in here. All right. So what is the big point I'm trying to make here? Um, is that there is, Mkai is not trying to make an argument that there should be a restoration of kinship as it were, right? But a critique of how colonial authority is organizing and how it's constituting <clears throat> uh, what this is with <clears throat> its laws, right? Uh, imitator and also not involving people to be part of the, uh, as not involving people to be part of the, um, political authority discourses and also participating in the rule. Um, and, and, and what he puts forward is that, uh, or, or maybe what he's trying to do here is brokering <coughs> these knowledges of the past of what he sees with, um, is, and also how political authority is done, but he's doing this in the goodness of the he sees with. All of these laws that are being, uh, you know, uh, you know, should be instituted, put forward, they should be for the goodness of the bigger decision, uh, not for the benefit of the king. Um, so I'm closing here to then draw back into the conversation about, you know, 
canon uh, that we have, there's uh, Professor Cook has touched on that yesterday. Um, that one of the things that have been highlighted um, is, is, is that in thinking about how you think about journalistic uh, um, curriculum, is that the canon itself, in terms of thinking about journalism, uh, its foundations, practices, the role of journalists, um, and their critique of the um, matters of, of political authority, is that we should broaden up the canon and not only rely on um you know um notions of you know um journalism as rooted from the global norm in america for example and here for, so, so the canon i mean the notion of canon as um as secular privileged books it dates back from the 17th century and initially accepted as texts coming from particular order uh, but more and more the word canon had come to be triggered as a list of literature that should be taught as finest works of a particular literature. So these texts influence young scholars and how they react or reject them. But most importantly, they contain a very particular set of values and ideologies. So I am very thrilled that we are having this conversation today because um, when I was a student in the School of Journalism, uh, you know, um, about seven years ago, uh, when I graduated in here, um, we the, the canonical text of journalism, principles, values, um, even when they were seen as progressive, were really inspired from the global north and in America. Um, so for me, the, the, the attempts to, to decolonize or to deconstruct the, the canon is very productive in unmasking the assumptions about the knowledge, the values, and the epistems of the journalistic practice and the writers of this part of the country too. So um, without universalizing things, but it's important that also the, journalist, the journalism practices and theories that are, are grounded in the deep histories of, the, of, of, of Southern Africa, but also of the Eastern Cape, as it is like uh, uh, forms the crucibles of journalism in, in, in South Africa. And what needs to be given a thorough consideration is the manner in which the deep local epistems and rich archive in the African languages should not only be included in the repertoire of texts constituting the canon, but also should be used to critique, to inspire journalists or journalism students um, of how change was navigated by the writers, how they responded to their contexts, and also how we can read that, uh, that work and also draw inspiration of how to deal with the failures of journalism today, which include serving the interests of the elites, perpetuating the inequalities, and being complicit to the failing democracy. So what I've offered here are just humble uh, thoughts in which I think we can use these African um, archival uh, resources and how we can read them in engaging um, you know, journalistic practice and education in South Africa. I thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting, re-establishing contact with an old uh, alumnus who can hopefully also show us the way in terms of what are the, the, the works that we can include. Uh, and we have a, another a, a alumna, Dubeida Jaffa, uh, who's going to take you know, with the Jeff spoke about the idea that we need a kind of national press to address kind of national problems. Um, I know there's a new international press that's just here. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, uh, and um, Sanele spoke very much about the idea of looking towards, you know, models that predate uh, our notion of, you know, journalism uh, and to look at forms of you know critiquing political engagement forms of storytelling that uh, go back uh, um, centuries if not millennia so over to you Zubeda. um it's it was so wonderful listening to all of you yesterday and now this morning and to listen to jeff and sanele 
uh, Jeff, uh, gosh, we we haven't seen each other for for so long. Um, it's quite frightening, but fantastic, of course, all the work and now to see that Sanele is deepening the process. That is so, um, uh, you know, it just makes me feel really, really happy. Um, I um, I have got a paper uh, that I can send to all of you uh, right now. Um, so you free, you can read it and all the details and all the arguments I make. But because it's such a short time, I thought, um, listening to everybody yesterday and listening today, I thought, let me perhaps just make some broad comments. Um, and instead of wading through the paper, um, I will touch on some of the, 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 the points that I make there, but um, I feel that we are grappling with, as a people, with who we are and who we are collectively and who we are individually. And um, I'm very concerned that there isn't, a, you know, a full understanding of the fact that journalists and storytellers are, you know, a very, very crucial part of that equation. Now, if the journalists and the storytellers um, are paid to to bash us all the time, uh, in the in uh, based on the theory that. You know, we must hold um, power to. We must hold. We must hold. Uh, put pressure on those in power. Then we don't get a chance to breathe and and understand what is our collective story. Uh, this cannot be the sole function of 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 journalists and storytellers. And I would argue that that we need to we need to go back and and craft a story that includes all of this that we've heard over the last or draws on all of this that we've heard over the last uh, day and a half and so that we can be able to say so that one day maybe our children our grandchildren can say Sanelis uh, son or daughter will say you know I live in 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 South Africa and people have been living here for over a million years and the earliest um, you know uh, records that we have are the are the, the rock paintings and etc 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 um yesterday tandeka um mentioned to that that we um we come come from a, a long rich history and um we have the on the african continent we have you know the um uh the formation of all the early formations of writing etc and the 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 point is what is the story that is going to be running through our minds? What is the story that ca carries us through? Now we've had, you know, three more than three hundred years of three. Well, not three hundred years, but in this time, this, there's been three narrative strands, and one is the the um, Africana story, which 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 was imposed on all of us. Um, making us start our history in 1652, and then there's the um, the, uh, the the liberation th uh, story, which uh, largely seems to uh, anchor in 1912, and even though you know there's been resistance for a very long time, and then you know you have the 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 liberal the liberal story um let me just check um um i'm getting a little bit confused um okay let me just say um before the birth of a democratic state in 1994 there were essentially three competing narratives coursing through the country's lifeblood in the past century. The liberation narrative, 
the Afrikaner narrative that became sidetracked uh, by apartheid ideology and the liberal narrative committed to assimilation of the African majority into a European ethos. So we had that and um, I quote in the paper Jabula and Debele quite extensively. Um, I also draw on Tabo Mbeki and others. But Jabula and Debele said that while apartheid insisted that the oppressed would develop better alone, liberals insisted that they would develop better within the prescriptions of the European. Both, he said, insisted on being the human reference point of all the people of this country. And when Sanele says, you know, over the years, and I mean, I was a student at Rhodes, uh, there were attempts to, uh, to introduce us to um, alternatives and uh, to talk about the black journalists, uh, etc. But essentially, essentially, the approach is um, rooted in the North. Essentially, the approach, approach to journalism is rooted in the North. It doesn't, it, we don't recognize, we don't grapple with the fact that our population is essentially uh, steeped in, in oral communication and um, and what does that mean for us when we tell our stories and how we should tell our stories? Uh, we don't grapple extensively with that. We, um, we also impose a certain uh, ideological frame when we deal with, um, when we deal with, um, um, with the way in which we structure our media. Now, it's not easy to, you know, start dismantling all that, but there are two, uh, I think a, a few of us have made, have, have, have made two contributions. One, I would say, was started in 2013 um, when I was at the University of the Free State and we launched in 2014 uh, a website called The Journalist. Uh, you can go on there, journalist.org.za. And we started this because we saw that the students were, were given, you know, a textbook that really was just a sanitized version of the old Afrikaner textbook and uh, written by, edited by Fouri. And uh, it gave them no perspective about who they were. And uh, so we started the journalist and we identified uh, the pioneers of journalism in an attempt to start the excavation and to bring the story not of black journalists. And I, I, I feel very uncomfortable often with this thing we say black journalism. I think it's the story of communication and storytelling in South Africa. It's our story. Because as soon as we say black, then it means we othering ourselves. As soon as we say there was, then, then black journalism means that there was a mainstream, there was something else, and then we were just the others. Now this has to stop. This absolutely has to stop. We have to tell our story from the point of view that this is our story, you know. In the, in the pre-colonial times, when do we want our story to start? Do we want just our story to start 3,000 years ago? Do we want to include Mapungubwe? Do we want to, what do we want to do? But that must be a story thread. And I feel the students today and the young professionals are you know, at the perfect point to, to, um, to work on this so that when a child grows up, the child will say will will have a completely different narrative, and will include the Eastern Cape writers. Um, and if you were a journalist, you will know that you were part of a very broad um, uh, history of communication um, in in this part of the world. Um, Sanele mentioned that um, there were rules, there were there were there were laws, there were ways of doing things. There was the connection to the spiritual, and um, so we didn't, you know, people didn't just suddenly emerge in 1652. That was an ideological construct, carefully, um, you know, kind of narrated and constructed. Um, 
by Afrikaner nationalism because they knew, uh, as I explain in the paper, that you essentially need, as Lottie Brand says um, in her book, Official Stories, Politics and National Narratives in Egypt and Algeria, she said you need the establishment of a founding uh, story, the conception of national identity, and the parameters of national unity. You need that. And for now, we've got some of it. We've got some of it. And I wouldn't argue that we throw all this away. Um, but we don't have that which makes us exceptionally proud. And there's a lot for us to be exceptionally proud about. Um, if we look at just those words, I mean, I was listening, I know uh, Diasas is Kosa Kanini. So <laughs> listening to Sanele with Mkai, and I mean, you know, those things should be our basic diet, you know. Um, and, you know, when I was uh, researching the book on Charlotte Mani Makreke, I, I just was amazed by the wealth that we that that we have and yet we we almost like look down on it or we, we we actually don't know it also and so the time is now if we are serious about the decolonial project not to throw away the tools because the tools the tools doesn't necessarily belong to anybody but to throw away the ideology that that kind of constrict the tools and to take, take um, all our tools and our interesting um, um, histories and to merge it and to show how rich we are, how amazing we are, how, how, the, how the, 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 the medicines and the, 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 the abilities that the, the tracking abilities that we had, all those things, how they've now become formalized in big drug companies and etc. But those those knowledges were here. Those indigenous knowledges were were strong. And all this research has been done. I mean, Dr. Wally Sarotti has done extensive work on the indigenous knowledges. Um, and there are many other, I mean, what Jeff has done, what everybody has done, it's all there, but we haven't kind of thought of how to weave it into a narrative. It doesn't have to be long, it can be short, and then, you know, we can, you know, have other um, elaborations, but a narrative that we grow up with that we grow up with and it's not it cannot just be about resistance and fighting and and liberation while that is very very important uh, it's an important part but it cannot just be about that it's got to be about the people of this part of the world the people and uh when the with the the um missionaries came and when the when the colonialists came that has to be an add on, but it can't be the it can't be, you know, the core, the core of who we are it cannot be that that is how our many of us were disrupted and many, many of our experiences were disrupted. Um, I mean, I come from part of me comes half of me comes from the Indonesian um, um, uh, Javanese islands where my ancestors were brought as slaves here. And we came with a certain knowledge of Islam, of, of healing and, and uh, quite sophisticated um, uh, knowledges and fed that into the situation. Um, and if you read and compulsory, I would say one of the texts besides some of these other texts is the poem, um, written or the speech given by Tabo Mbeki, uh, the I'm an African speech. It's got all the elements there. And it's, 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 I start my paper with that, um, the Mbeki speech. And um, I think for the next, for the young generation of journalists and storytellers, 
it is for them to actually um, craft that, deepen that, take the text that we think would be fabulous for us and uh, and that makes sense to us and make sure that every single journalist i'm not just talking about journalism <laughs> uh, obviously it'd be great if it's across the country but i'm talking about journalists every single storyteller um these quotes and these sayings trip off their tongues because we are the ones that hold that is are meant to hold the society together. The Mbongi, you know, the soothsayer, the all, all these these um, institutions that we've had through the ages. We are the extension of those institutions, and uh, so we need to play that role in our society. We are not there to bash everybody over the head. We are there to point out wrongs, but we also there to point out the rights and we're there to hold the fabric of that society together if you look at just for an example the recent um funeral of the queen i mean i was just amazed you know i had to take my hat off to um uh, british imperialism because they're able to hold the story it's a nonsense story though i mean it's not a true story it's not a it's not a beautiful story but they are able to hold a story that has meaning for them um, and we don't have a whole story we have elements of it but we need a whole story that will make us whole irrespective of what nonsense is going on doesn't matter if you know Grahamstown Makanda isn't at the moment functioning to full capacity the municipality is dysfunctional jeff has done amazing work and continues to do amazing work and many other people that's we have to continue but we must know who we are and we must be proud of who we are because we are magnificent people and the storytellers and the journalists have to communicate that i'm going to i'm going to leave it there I have a lot to say. There's a lot in the paper that I haven't even touched on, but I think it may be a bit uh, uh, a letter. It may be a bit, but um, more useful to you know have open discussion than for me to necessarily repeat. Um, I would have loved to talk about Sitsi uh, Dangeramga and what she says because that touches on the economics uh, element of the storytelling but um and it ties up with what jeff said because we we we've got to look at the how to give us a story that makes us proud and strong and and that recognizes all the great intellectuals and thoughts and leaders and people and poets etc cetera, etc cetera. but we also have to think through the economics of 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 the industry and of our and of our craft so and and i i, I deal a little bit with that in the in in the paper but uh, allow me to complete now and so that we can go over to a general discussion thank you very much thank you so much you. so we now have some time for questions i just like to thank the three panelists who really you know kickstarting this whole discussion i think there's been some really really valuable points made here and we're so lucky to have uh, historians in our midst uh, i know uh Sanela, you started off with us but you very much moved into that history field and the beta even though you're very much in the history field your work shows that deep connection with history and we will circulate that paper um, thank you very much. Um, for me, the, the whole idea, the beta that you mentioned there around the idea of call and, you know, uh, um, looking at, you know, what is the, you know, the real kind of core of our history that's kind of been blinded by this kind of colonial veneer uh, is, I think, is, is quite an uh, exciting idea. Sanelis touched on it in relation to the idea of the canon. 
uh, in the film that um, Jeff helped us make that you saw yesterday, that's also something that came out really powerfully. You know, that one needs to remember that the values that we now hold as, you know, this is universal values of our constitution, those were not the values held by the colonialists. Those were the values held by the Black Eastern Cape intellectuals. And, and they were the ones that pushed through those values that eventually became the values of our constitution that we now just see as, you know, those are kind of mainstream core values. We don't realize where, where they come from. Um, and uh, yeah, so what, uh, so also I think what's important is the whole idea of the, uh, that we need to speak and what's, you know, often we realize that our journalism as journalists, we only really speak to the middle class, which I think is hardly 20% of the population. I'm not, you know, um, got my figures, not 100%, but I think it's roundabout. And we need to speak um, to our, you know, our broad population, 50% of which are below the what's considered the, the poverty line. We need to embrace all our languages. English is only spoken as a first language by a small group of people in our, in our country. Um, so those are some of the issues that you've raised um, that I'm sure we'll engage on more. But I'll now hand over to the floor. And what I'd like to plead with, I see we've only got seven minutes left till tea. Can we can we extend that a little bit? Because I think we, we, there's important issues that have been raised here. Okay, should we take uh, three questions to start off with? Um, I just wanted to um, thank you, Carla. thank you, um, panelists. That, that was really fascinating. I wanted to say that I found it useful the way um, Jeff um, divided um, his talk into issues of money, issues of who the reader is, and the issue of who the writer would describe is. But I'm concerned about history and hidden histories in particular, concerned about what is said about money and what isn't said about money. Let me give you some examples. Often said um, in the story of Batu, um, Abantu Batu, it's not mentioned very often in those histories that we have that it was funded by the Swazi royal family and that um, the queen was the, the main patron of um, Pixligaseme's efforts um, that were shattered by mining capital when Bella and the others ran to the mining um, bosses to, 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 to bring these others down. And um, Mtitelele was obviously a, a, a lapdog um, and Whereas um, Pixley's paper was able to speak more radically about um, black interests and act and talk more radically around the mine worker strike um, at the early parts of the century. But we often don't find the funding as significant there. Whereas in the story of um, John Tango and um, Imvo, you see Rose Innes and you see. Um, a lot said they, and you see those who, who wanted to take out Tengo um, or, or, or take out Jababu um, going to Rhodes and the significance of Rhodes's fall um, in, in being a chink or a sort of milestone in, in black um, newspaper history. Another thing that's not said is that um, Sol Blackie was funded by the Molemas and the Molemas were his was a funny story because there are endogamas up there in the north. So partly relatives of his wife, partly his own relatives. So they were funded by the Tswana kingdoms that lost out to the Kita ward um, when the British decided to help themselves to the law and to whoever um, had what remained of the northern diamond fields. So um, his dash to Kimberley was because he was broke. And um, mining capital made a little plan for him by um, putting him and Zala inside the diamond advertiser of Kimberley. 
Um, so the story of how mining capital takes out um, early black newspapers is really not is a is a very significant strand in the story, but um, is it's little visited by us. Uh, another part of the the funding story is that the southern kingdoms, Zona kingdoms, had the most bullish account of the Standard Bank. Um, those are the the southern kingdoms, and they had newspapers. Another thing about the the silent and spoken history is that be, when the Tosa fought undefeated eight anti-colonial wars, as Jeff would know, here in this region, there were runners, journalists who ran and tell the other kingdoms that this is what has happened down there. Um, we don't hear the stories of those runners, and these are hidden histories that, if we're serious about decolonizing and telling the real story of who we really are, is you know, those, those people are significant. They're like Kratora out there. And the, our ancestors that are little recognized are the people who were called interpreters mm -hmm. because they spoke a multiplicity of languages. Even Sol Blythe, um was an interpreter. So um, the, the interpreters don't come into our story in, a, in um, a way that recognizes what we owe to them. The other thing, sorry to be long, is that I agree so much with Zubeda that we are so old. We, it's a long, 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 long story. We are on the world's oldest continent from where everybody stood up and walked on two feet and populated the, the world. So the story of how Kosa is, the, the, the structure of Tosa is never told. Like it's a, a visual language. And that comes from the fact that the previous writing systems were in hieroglyphs. The eye of Horus is Mona. A dog is Ndwa. The, the Ukamata is the sun god. And, and we, we don't go there for some reason. And we continue to elevate the great march of white Western men from Greece to Rome to us, and then the musket, the fagadolo, and the bayonet. We were people before they came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, another question or comments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I suppose this is to Jamaica, but uh, Sumeda, sorry, or anyone else who wants to try and answer it. But um that thing she said about being proud of who we are collectively. In my experience, <laughs> journalism training and education can be quite prescriptive about what a professional journalist is, right? And it's often a thing apart from the people you are speaking to and speaking for. So when that kind of assimilation goes um, further in practice and is further rooted in practice, I mean, I worked in broadcast for a very long time, so everything from my hair to how I spoke was under scrutiny from day one and every day since. So now we're in a situation where I have students whose personal aspirations run par parallel to that assimilation project, and they can't separate the two. So how do we make it plain to students that your accent is viable the way it is? Your hair does not need to be changed. Um, and that becomes the norm of what we see and how we write and how we relate to other people. Thank you for the presentations. I think these histories are vital to having students understand, students, people in general understand how to communicate histories more broadly. My biggest question comes to the, we know this is important, we know this is valuable, we know that it's real, we know that's true. How do we now sense make this important history to where we are today? So if you look at kind of journalism education, journalism practice, there's very little space, barely any space for this history, for this way of thinking, way of doing, way of being, way of storytelling. How do we reconcile this important moment with where we are and where we go? I think we've, I see there's more questions, but I think we're on to these we're going to move to another round. Um, who would like to 
who's trying to respond? Jeff and then Jeff and Jeff and Jeff and Jeff and Jeff. Um, well, 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 I just would like to appreciate very much uh, what Tandeka has said, uh, because I ran out of time. I was going to mention uh, both uh, Queen Lavotsibeni and also the role of the, the uh, Malema family. But I would also like to greatly appreciate uh, your mention of the way in which literate uh, uh, Africans in, in key positions uh, turn the, the weapons of literacy against the, 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 the other. Uh, and I would just like to, to mention, and I am finishing now, uh, the, the role of uh, Chief uh, N.C. Kondile Mala, the son of Mala Kandlambe, who spent time on Robben Island. Uh, who was fired as an interpreter because uh, during the, the last frontier war, the ninth war, uh, he was he was passing information. In fact, uh, all the black uh, interpreters, and they also used to work in the, uh, it was called telegraph, they called telegraphs in those days. They all had to be fired because although they were uh, theoretically uh, subjects of the Queen, they, they knew where their duty lay. Um, but actually, I think at a, at a certain point, uh, historians have to uh, step back from, from uh, these debates, because uh, the thing is that the past is known because it's, it's not properly reproduced, but it's over now. And the, the real role um, I think of the the media, because uh, I mean there's so much history you can pick and choose, uh, an old telephone directory. Uh, I, I mean that's tell, can tell you who was living in Makanda in 1903. So there is no shortage of facts. The trick is to pick from the the ocean of information, that information which is is, is relevant. So somebody like a historian, uh, and, and, and they are tricky people, I can tell you, uh, has to stand back uh, because, uh, you know, the future, is the, <laughs> the past is ours. It's, it's knowable. The future is not. So those of us who dwell on the past without seeing the past as a means to create the future, to shape the future uh, are actually leading you off a cliff. So um, I really uh, feel that I've, um, it's not because I'm 72 years old, but because I'm a historian, it's, it's basically over to you. It's basically over to you. And, and I think, um, you know, in, the, in the, the history of the teaching of journalism uh, you know, in this country, uh, this particular department has played a major role. And, and I really would like to thank the organizers and participants, uh, because I think you are the generation that under much worse circumstances uh, than, than apartheid, but must take this further, because at, at least during the, the apartheid era, there was a strong, clear narrative that was unacceptable and could easily be fought against and destroyed. But living today in a world of psychobabble, where the noise is drowning up. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, when I was, how can I put it? When I was a student at, at the University of Cape Town, in, in, in 1968, there was a sort of a, a slogan from some Canadian, the media is the message. Mm -hmm. Now there's no message. There's no message coming out. There's just this noise. And then it's up to the, um, the thing is intellectuals have a role. And the role of the intellectual is to come up with a clear way forward. 
and, and, you, and, and a way forward cannot be devised in a mass meeting. And it's not anti-democratic uh, for people to, without imposing their will, but to come up with a, a line of approach. And, and I fully agree with uh, what Zubayda has said. We need a narrative that we can all get behind. But what is that narrative? Thank you. Thank you. Go back to Kevin. So then if you want to uh, take that forward, I mean, there's been a couple of questions related to what do we teach now? Um, yeah, that's a very difficult one. Um, but I think this kind of gathering is a starting point. Um, I think having these kinds of conversations is, is very important, but then maybe the important question is that what do we do with this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, so I've been mean, doing the work of you know engaging in decolonization is a very difficult, very dirty, very hands-on, um, ongoing process. Um, and perhaps what we need to collectively think as uh, you know, young and old people um, who are thinking about also our own curricular design is about you know thinking about these questions and also how do we integrate that you know these kinds of you know conversations in our own curricular design. And I am not um I am I am not um uh, oblivious to the fact that the departments sometimes, the, the, the institutions, they do push back, um, you know, when this kind of work is being done um, and that it, is, it, it does not come easy. But I think this, this is a really good starting point um, in, in having these conversations and, and mapping out, out really what is the kind of story, um, what is the kind of, you know, um, you know, texts that are being, you know, included in the curriculum, what kind of methodologies are being included in, in, in the curriculum, what is excluded, what is um, also included. So I think that is uh, really important. And I, can't, I don't have an answer, um, you know, to, to, to what, how do we reconcile everything that is being, what, what you're talking about with where we are right now. I think this is a really good starting point. And perhaps for me, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the notion of a collective story, that we all need to rally behind one collective story. Um, because, I mean, we, 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 we have a really, um, we have a very violent history that we need to contend with. Um, we have um, definitely entangled histories. We, we have complicated histories. Um, and there's been voices that have been excluded for a very long time, and we're still making sense of that right now. You know, how do we amplify these voices um, in, in terms of making sense of, 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 of our story as a, as a country? Because there's been narratives uh, since the inception of the academy, it has historically and conceptually excluded very particular narratives, you know? Um, and so the starting point is then, you know what how do we pay attention to this how do we bring them in also makes sense because um when we're bringing them in we are not bringing them just to have a multiplicity of like uh, uh, of knowledges but also like we grapple we look at them um critically and um, you know they, they are not perfect we engage them and engage other um you know kind of competing knowledge that already are existing so i think for me it is about really the priority um it is it, we have to be clear with what we want to do at the present moment in order to arrive to a, a, a story, a, a, a story that we perhaps, you know, uh, mobilize behind, but I don't think we're at the point now. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be an application of voices that have been marginalized for a very long time. If you've got some thoughts, we are running a bit into the next session. So I know I promised those two people we have their their comments. So hopefully we can uh, get there. Uh, if you can, um, um, can you can you hear me? A comment. I think there were, there were two questions. Did you on what do we teach now? 
And I think it's linked to this idea of building new stories. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Um, I, it, it's not an easy um, matter this, but I would suggest that the first place where we have to start is to work on the, the course uh, uh, that we teach on media history and consider do a lot of work on that and see how we how we structure the narrative bring in all these elements how when the journalist student goes through this they understand oh they're part of this really big uh, you know the it's not suddenly whoops you know um western media came so that i think i would say media history secondly the question about what do students do if they now you know if let's say we change the whole thinking and now student students go into the um, industry and this doesn't help them you know it doesn't help them in terms of um of their job and so it's a very difficult it's a, it's a challenging moment but i can speak from my own experience that because I had a very strong sense of who I was, that I understood that I was many different things, that I was, there were many different aspects I, of myself, that I wasn't just a, as defined by apartheid, uh, Cape Malay that was um, uh, pigeonholed into a colored area. I understood that uh, partly because of my upbringing, and then coming to the Eastern Cape as a student, that really, really made my understanding, you know, through black consciousness, made me understand, um, you know, myself even more deeply. So by the time I went into the industry, I knew what the industry was, I could sort of accept what the industry was about, but I knew what I was about too. So I pursued and followed through um, approaches that I felt was going to strengthen and lead us to um, a space of greater freedom. And so I don't think it, it really matters. Um, it doesn't matter so much where you, where you, if you're stuck now in a institution that is untransformed, but it matters that you are transformed, that you know who you are and who you are as South African. And you are many, many things all together. It's not a single narrative. You are many things all together, and you can be proud of all those many things. <laughs> 